go ahead and type in all of your burning top of mind um, nutrition specific questions. So um, try to be as specific as you can. And again, we'll get to some of them at the end of class today. Which is gonna give you a minute or two to go ahead and do that. Oh, I see them coming in, lots of them, great. I'll just answer one of them really quickly. Yes, we are recording today's um, content and um, I'm gonna share with you in just a moment what that's gonna look like. Let's just take one more minute as you're putting in those questions. So um, what will happen moving forward after today's class, you will also receive a post email um, following up today's information. And what will, that will include is a short little summary. It'll include the link from today's um, content and then any um, sort of takeaways, whether it be a PDF document or a checklist, we'll include that in the summary. And you can come to expect um, in these classes that you're gonna get a reminder email We'll have the class and then you'll get a post email. So we'll, we'll find our flow or our rhythm um, very, very quickly. Sound good? I wish I could see you all, but I'll take it from my team. We sound good? Everybody's ready to go? Okay, all right. So um, let me just do quick introductions and we'll dive right in. My name is Stacy Fritz. I am a part-time patient advocate who loves her job here at Believe Big. I'm also a business owner, corporate wellness um, owner of Fit to Order. Um, I am also somebody who can is just probably similar to many of you on the call. Um, a couple of my family members were also on the cancering journey, and I too had many questions about nutrition as we traveled the course. So I feel like I can wear many hats um, on this conversation. I will be the moderator for Food for Thought. And um, again, if you should have questions beyond just the information that I shared, you can contact me directly. That will be in your summary um, email. I'll have my email address in there and I'm happy to answer your questions or point you in the right direction. Um, I am so thrilled to be introducing our rock star today. Her name is Paula Weinberg. Um, she's got a super cool background. She is a former stressed and unsatisfied litigator. That's right, she was a former litigator who did what I think many of us have wanted to do from time to time, which is change our whole career path. She actually did it. And she went after her true passion, which was nutrition. She got her master's from the human clinical nutrition, in, excuse me, in human clinical nutrition from Maryland University of Integrative Health. Um, she also went on to start her own integrative private practice called HealthSpan. And if that's not enough, uh, after realizing that folks like all of us on the webinar today, those who are on the cancering journey, um, did not have access to credible information, she took it a step far further and up-leveled her skill set to um, working on her oncology nutrition certification, which she'll, she will complete um, very shortly. So that was a lot, but she has done a lot, and we are so lucky to have her for the next couple of months with her. One more rock star on the on the webinar. I'd like to introduce all of you all to Ivalice Page, and this is a special treat for us. And we can't expect that she's going to be with us every single um, class, but she found it just equally as important to to um, be with us today to give us lots of love and support as we kick off this food for thought nutrition program. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Paula. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Stacey. Um, um, happy Wednesday, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. It's such an honor and privilege to talk to you all about something I'm so passionate about and to kick off this debut session of Food for Thought. Um, so let's dive into our first topic here. And let me just share my screen and get this going here. Okay. All right, um, everybody can see that. Um, I think we're all set. Okay, so today we're diving into why does food matter? So opinions and advice around what to eat are everywhere. Why do we care so much about what we eat? What's all the fuss? There's so much talk about what to eat and what not to eat, and it often points us in opposite directions. 
There are so many popular diets out there and each one promises a slew of health benefits. So let's dive into why food matters and begin to learn how to sift through the, the nutrition information that's out there. We are human beings made up of trillions of cells. Yes, trillions, a number so large it's almost meaningless as we can't really even fathom what trillions looks like. While many of our cells are distinctly different from one another, our eyes are very different from our lungs, for example, they all share many fundamental similarities. All cells contain the same basic cellular components, a nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, cell membranes, and a variety of other organelles that you can see here that have very specific jobs. While it isn't important for you to understand the name and function of all the different cellular parts, it is important to understand that each of these very intricate parts of each one of our cells require an assortment of raw materials to carry out all their various functions. What sorts of raw materials you ask? Proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and more. Where do these come from? Food. What we eat has a profound effect on each of our cells and how our cells function. The vitamins, minerals, and other components of our food serve as the cofactors or assistants to the thousands of different jobs our cells must do. Being deficient in these micronutrients can result in cellular dysfunction, which means a reduced ability for the cell to perform its duties or possibly even cease functioning completely. Nutrient imbalances put a strain on your cells tissues, organs, and organ systems. In other words, what happens to you at the cellular level is what you experience in your body and how you feel day to day. Short-term nutrient imbalances may go unnoticed, but by the time you experience physical symptoms of imbalance, fatigue, pain, inflammation, the nutrient imbalances behind those symptoms are likely chronic and the number of cells affected before physical symptoms appear are likely significant. If a cell cannot function optimally with all necessary raw materials available, the metabolic functions necessary to sustain life are compromised. It's like trying to bake a loaf of bread without flour or another key ingredient like yeast. The outcome will be some sort of baked good. It just might not resemble an appearance or taste the bread you tried to make. It's the same with cells. They'll try to make do with what they have, but they may not be able to fulfill their duties as they're designed to do. An inadequate intake of vitamins and minerals from food can actually lead to DNA damage, mitochondrial decay, and other disease pathologies. So when our cells aren't getting what they need, function is compromised and maybe even interrupted altogether. And it's very likely that something goes wrong, like the bread without flour or yeast or the dough not being allowed to rise before baking. It's still a loaf of bread, but maybe not the one you'd want to eat. Having the correct raw materials for our cells at the right time to perform the labyrinth intricate cellular workings that are happening in our bodies 24 seven is critical. Not having those correct raw materials like vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants can lead to cellular impairment. Precisely where or how that cellular impairment shows up for you has to do with your genetics, but it's actually the environment, our food, water, air, toxins that impact the ex expression of our genetics. Disease, whether it's cancer or something else, is not a simple cause and effect equation. Otherwise, the war on cancer would have been won decades ago. Healing from cancer is rarely as simple as changing only what we eat. But without the foundation of eating the right food, healing becomes much more challenging. We all know the tremendous impact that food can have on our health and our bodies. We all experience it every day. Luckily, it's also something most of us have significant control over. To illustrate the incredible power of food, I'd like to share with you the details of a landmark scientific experiment performed in the early 2000s on agouti mice. Agouti mice are mice that carry the agouti gene, which gives mice a hallmark yellow fur coat and makes them ravenous for food, obese, prone to cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and shortened lifespans. In this experiment, they took female agouti mice and supplemented their food with four vitamins, folic acid, B12, choline, and betaine, before the mice became pregnant, sort of like giving them a prenatal vitamin. What happened next when these agouti mice gave birth was astounding. Most of the offspring of the mice, given the vitamin blend, had a normal brown coat, 
not the yellow one agouti mice were known for. They were also slender, had a normal lifespan, and were not prone to cancer, heart disease, or diabetes. I'm not sure if you, can, you all can see that distinction there in your slide. My uh, camera is covering up some of the brown, brown mouse. Hopefully you guys can see both. But without changing the DNA of the mice, the vitamin blend was able to alter the expression of the agouti gene in the pregnant mice, suppressing or silencing its health effects on the offspring. In other words, the DNA passed down from mother to child was the same, yet only the mice given the prenatal vitamin gave birth to normal brown mice. If you ever doubt the power of food, you need look no further than the agouti mice experiments. There are countless other such examples of the power of food in healing the body and altering the expression of a disease pathology in humans as well, just typically not performed in a lab, but carried out in real life. You might know some of such people yourselves. Take, for example, Dr. Terry Walls, who at age 48 was confined to a tilt recline wheelchair as a result of multiple sclerosis. With conventional medicines failing to slow the rapid progression of this devastating disease, she set out to discover how to heal herself. After six months of altering her diet in a very significant way, she was able to walk unassisted throughout the hospital where she worked as a doctor. This bears repeating. In six months, Dr. Walls ate herself out of a wheelchair, halting disease progression and resuming a very active and high quality life. Did Dr. Walls do other things besides radically change her diet? Yes, absolutely. And you can read all about her journey in, her, in more detail in her fantastic book called The Walls Protocol. But the change in diet that she experienced was by far the most profound change she implemented. As of today at age 66, Dr. Walls continues to work as a physician, continues to lead a very active life, including hiking and biking regularly. Dr. Walls reports that she has learned to listen to her body and for her best health, strictly avoids gluten, dairy, and eggs as they cause her to experience pain and nerve dysfunction associated with her disease within only hours of consumption. There are also a myriad of foods that she must eat daily to support healthy cellular function. Dr. Walls' experience with MS not only completely changed her prognosis, but also completely changed how she practiced medicine. She says of her transformation in her book, the old me who had relied on drugs and procedures to make my patients well, who had been made progressively more feeble by my illness, had been placed, replaced with someone who understood intellectually and physically that disease begins at the cellular level. When cells are starved of the building blocks, they need to conduct the chemistry of life properly. And that the root of optimal health begins with taking away the things that harm and confuse our cells while providing the body with the right environment in which to thrive. I finally understood what I had to do to provide my cells with all the building blocks of life they needed to heal. I was doing it and it was working. Cellular, cellular nutrition is everything. It is the very basis of health. Everybody still with me? We're gonna unpack this business of cellular health a little bit more by starting with another quote. Every bite of food you eat is an investment in your future or it's a debt you're taking out. You see, each time you take in food, your body has to break it down, both mechanically by chewing it and then chemically by exposing it to a variety of things such as enzymes and stomach acid and bile, which happen along the way through the GI tract. If you eat a carbohydrate, for example, whether it's a fruit or a vegetable or a slice of bread, your body engages in a process called glycolysis. Now, that's a fancy scientific name and you don't need to know exactly what it is or understand the steps that you see here, but you do need to understand this takeaway. Each step of breaking down our food requires enzymes, which are made of proteins, and many, many nutrients. So if the food you are eating does not contain nutrients, you're depleting your body of essential nutrients each time you eat because the process of eating them uses it up. It's like taking money out of the bank several times per day, but never making a deposit. Eventually, there's no money left and life comes to a screeching halt. It's the same for your cells. They will continue to break down your food and carry out all your vital bodily functions with whatever nutrients and building blocks available. But at some point when the nutrients and raw materials run out, 
cellular function becomes impaired and may even go completely awry. It is possible, however, to have an adequate or even excess amount of calories in your diet and yet have your cells be very nutrient deficient. The more processed the food you eat, the fewer nutrients it tends to contain, and those it does contain have been added back synthetically in order to have the substance even qualify as food. So if a person is regularly consuming processed and sugar-laden foods, which contain very few nutrients, but tend to be very high in calories, their cells are actually starving in a nutrient sense way, yet they likely carry excess body weight in the form of fat because their calories are plentiful, but their nutrients depleted and deficient. There is a price to be paid by the body in metabolizing food. It takes energy, many nutrients, and creates metabolic waste, along with bringing in possibly unwanted chemicals and toxins that can wreak havoc with our health if left unchecked. What you choose to put inside your body should be thoughtfully considered. In the words of Alan Green, with each meal, will you be making an investment in your health or creating a debt your body has to pay back? Eating a nutrient-dense diet is the very basis of health. Our cells are quite literally made of what we eat. This is basic and fundamental science. It's undisputed, and that has been well-known and well-studied for decades which is why I find the ignorance of nutrition among healthcare workers incredibly frustrating. Health, in my opinion, cannot be realized without understanding the role that nutrients play in our cells and in our bodies, and without eating a nutrient-rich diet. This is true for everyone. You're either building health or enabling disease each time you sit down to eat. More eloquently stated by Anne Wigmore, the food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Food is first and foremost fuel for the body, like gas for your car. If you filled your car with diesel fuel, but you weren't driving a car with a diesel engine, how long do you think it would take before your car broke down? I don't know the answer. Maybe we have an auto expert in the audience who can put it in the chat for us, but my guess is not too long. Each day, several times a day, we have the privilege and responsibility of eating. With every privilege comes responsibility. The consumption of food has a price, energy, nutrients, the exposure to environmental toxins and chemicals and metabolic waste. Yet our body was perfectly designed to handle the wear and tear of eating when consuming natural nutrient rich whole foods. The industrialization of our world and our food supply has led to chronically increasing exposure to toxins over the last 100 years. This has stretched our very ancient cellular workings to the max and our sickly and overweight population bears witness to it daily. Chronic nutrient deficiency has a price, poor immune function, pain, inflammation, brain fog, anxiety, depression, low energy, that's just to name a few. If it's not coming into your body through food, where are the nutrients that your cells require to perform vi vital bodily functions coming from? It's worth thinking about and taking some time to reflect on the nutrient content of your intake. One of the ways to do so might be to journal your food and beverage intake for a week or so, and you can use an app that might be able to help you see the nutrient content of each specific food and help you make some of those connections. Here are two helpful apps called Chronometer and MyFitnessPal, and you can find those easily for free on the, on the web. Over the next several months, we're going to unpack what a nutrient-rich diet looks like, how to fuel our bodies for optimal function, and how to minimize exposure to environmental toxins. So I hope that was helpful. And now we're going to circle back to Stacy and our, get, get to our Q&A, I think. Wow, that was um, that was awesome, Paula. I I'm, I tease, but the color orange from Cheetos is not one of the food groups. I'm thinking the answer is no. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. All right, you guys, it's time for you to um, kind of give us some little bit of feedback before we launch into putting Paula on the hot seat. Put in this time, not in the Q and A. Go ahead and put in the chat one thing that you didn't know that you learned about in these past 20 minutes with Paula. Just, I'm just curious, I'm just making sure that we're on task. I'd love to know one thing that you did not know that um, Paula shared with us. You all are super smart and you understood everything. Oh, I see. Um, 
we have a friend that mentioned the breakdown and the nutrition and the nutrients. Excellent. Uh, the story of Dr. Wall, one person said they didn't know about that. Anybody else? Oh, the chronometer app. And just so you know, I'll comment on that. Just as a reminder, if you came in late, do not worry about um, trying to write everything down. We will make sure that you have the takeaways um, in our follow-up email. So um, don't worry about those apps. We'll make sure that that's in there. Well, that's great. We got a couple of takeaways. I'm going to do one better, ladies. I'm going to share with our group. Um, we're gonna give you a little bit of um, fun homework. I hope it's fun for you all. I'm gonna share my screen and also in your follow-up email, um, what I would like to share with you is, let me pull it up. Um, let's take a look right here. Hopefully everybody can see me. Can my team give me the thumbs up if you see that? All right, so in your email, you're gonna have this three-day food journal. And what is that? Well, as I mentioned to you on the beginning of our, our, our first class here, we're not going to get into specific uh, recommendations for you personally, but you are. So what this is, is a tool for you. As we learn more from Paula, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and when you receive this attachment, go ahead and find a way to get it printed out, or you can take on another notebook and just kind of write down the details. And what I'd like you to do is for three days in a row, I'm teasing you, but I'm actually serious. I want you to write down every BLT, and BLT stands for bites, licks, and tastes. I want you to write it all down, everything that you consume in the next three days. And what that's going to do is this is going to be a guided tool for us as we start diving in deeper and deeper. You can use it as an awareness tool that you yourself can learn from Paula and start either editing your nutrition yourself you can revise it completely yourself, or maybe you just start to add in layers slowly, which I always find is a really helpful learning technique. We're not doing everything all at once, but as you start to, as Paula used the word, unpack the information, you then can start auto-correcting, if you will, your own nutrition to make it healthier, to make it um, better for you, to make your nutrition healing. Um, I, I, I find this is a really great tool to work with um, with folks because it's real time, it's your life. It's not somebody else telling you uh, what, your, what your nutrition needs to look like. It's you creating your own healthy plates. Sound good? All right, so if we don't have any more comments on one thing you learned, I'm going to dive into what I'm sure is going to be a, a really great part of our class the, um, each, you know, the couple times a month is a Q&A. It's a way for you to get your own answers to questions that perhaps maybe you've been, you've heard something that's not, um, that's confusing you, or perhaps maybe you, um, it's contradictory to something maybe your doctor has said or that you feel is, is true. I, I want to share with you, we're going to have to navigate this carefully because again, we want to make sure that we are giving you the best solid information um, without you feeling like we're giving specific um, uh, information. So that said, I'm going to fire off these questions and poor Paula um, for our very first one. She's on the hot seat, um, friends. All right, so first question, Paula, and Paula has the right to say, I'm gonna get back to you on that, all right? So if there's something that uh, uh, she's gonna take a look in, uh, without us, we're gonna allow her that grace, of course, because this is a safe space on both sides. Um, first question, Paula, how much do herbs come into play with optimal health and healing, in your opinion? I think herbs are a really great way to pack in a lot of nutrients and they're can be really important in the cancer healing journey. Um, so herbs or fresh herbs, dried herbs, both are really powerful um, foods that you can really up the game of whatever it is your favorite meal is just by adding some fresh herbs or dried herbs to them. And there are certain herbs that are, you know, more potent and certainly more, you know, more well tested in the cancer world. Um, again, that doesn't mean that other herbs are less. It's just simply that science gets interested in certain things and it takes a lot of money and a lot of time to test foods and bear out these scientific um, facts for us. So we have a lot of facts on, you know, like cilantro and, and uh, parsley. There's a lot of great evidence on those, but um, there's a lot of 
you know, I wouldn't discount other herbs simply because there's not scientific data yet on that. So I would definitely encourage you to use herbs, spices um, liberally, you know, seek out organic if possible. Um, they're, you know, dried herbs can be irradiated and that, you know, negates a lot of the benefits of those herbs um, of a traditional, say like, you know, a grocery store brand that's not organic, you might not be getting the potency that you think you are. So looking for organic is important and we'll dive into that a little bit more in future sessions. Oh, I agree. That could be a whole thing, right? And brings us to essential oils and all of those healing properties. So that, that was a great question. All right, this is um, a double-edged sword. So don't panic, Paula, you ready? I'm ready. What is the right diet? If you're on the cancering journey, what is the right diet? I, I couldn't I couldn't pass that question up because I think that's um, that is a question we have across the board, right? Yeah, that's a perfect question, and I so appreciate that question, and um, really want the listener to know that um, I hear you, and I'm not my attempt is not to not answer you, but I'm going to answer in the best way possible um, to be true for all of us. And honestly, that diet's going to look slightly different for everyone, but we are going to dive into in the next you know, weeks ahead of what that diet looks like as a baseline foundation for everyone. Um, so starting with you know, eating whole foods is important. Um, you know, getting rid of processed foods, eliminating, you know, sugars and refined flours and things like that are going to be key points in elevating where your diet might be. But the specifics of what one diet might be versus for an, uh, one person or another is, is really hard to say with any kind of meaningful insight without knowing that person's body and their medical history and exactly what's going on with them. And that's true of, you know, my clients that do not have cancer and true of clients that do have cancer. There isn't one answer for everyone. Um, there's not a magic diet that exists that is the answer for all. And that's what can make it so confusing um, oftentimes is because you, you hear that oh, one person did this and they had great results and another person did a completely what seems like an opposite thing. You know, you can hear vegan stories, success stories and keto success stories. And what's the right answer? Well, that was the right thing for them at that time. And um, also what, what is right for you in, in a process of healing from a disease isn't necessarily what's good for you in the long term, five years down the road. So things evolve and change and knowing yourself and your body and listening to that is probably the most important part. So we'll get started next session and future sessions, diving really quickly and deeply into what does that mean? The foundational pieces of having, a, you know, a core sound diet and the details around that will then have to be kind of looked at um, with a, with a healthcare provider that knows you best and your specific, you know, labs and situation, um, best. I hope Great that was answer. helpful. Great answer. Because, uh, that's the same thing that you said on the front end of our, our content, right? We're all different. And the cancer journey is different for everybody because our bodies are built differently and we're, we, we have different needs separate from the next person. So, um, excellent answer. And my takeaway from what you said is, that um, foundationally speaking, all of us can be doing better things and stuff, if you will, for ourselves. But when it comes down to these small nuances, addressing a specific diagnosis or a, a kind of cancer um, or where somebody is in, uh, on the journey um, is particular to that person's, as, as we know, the internal terrain, which many of us know that term. So I, I'm looking forward to that information as well. All right. Here's another really broad question for you. Do you think that dairy is bad for everyone? That's um, a great question as well. Um, so dairy has, dairies, we are the only species that of animal that drinks another species milk as sustenance. There's no other species in, in, in our world that does that. Um, and what happens is most of us don't 
hang on to the ability to digest um, the, the lactose in milk um, beyond our early, early years. Some cultures have built their culture around that, particularly like Scandinavian cultures and European cultures have built once uh, food industrialization and um, agriculture became a, a thing, um, they started to build their their life and their culture around dairy products and really evolved over generations to really be good handlers of that dairy product. And so again, that's really specific to each person. Um, the best thing to do is kind of listen to the wisdom of your body. Um, how do you feel after you eat dairy? Um, eliminating it for a period of time can give you a better, um, almost kind of give you a hearing aid for your body if you need that to kind of turn up the clarity um, to see if you feel different when you're eating it versus when you don't. Um, trusting your body and your instincts is really important and to kind of learn your body and what it, um, how it, what it responds well to, what food is good fuel for you and what food feels not good to you. So um, again, without knowing a specific you know, person and all of their information, it's um, not a blanket yes or no, but listening to your body and knowing that dairy is not required to um, derive the calcium needs that we have as humans, we can definitely get those from plants and a lot of other sources. Um, so dairy is not a necessary food, but it's not a bad food. And it, you kind of have to tune into your own body and listen to itself, uh, listen to what it's saying when you eat dairy to see if that's something that's good for you. And of course, discuss it with your health providers. Paula, would the same thing be true um, for clumping eggs into that conversation? Would eggs also, would you have the same um, comment about it? Yeah, eggs have a lot of great nutrient qualities. There's choline and a lot of you know healthy um, nutrients in an egg. At the same time, everyone has a different genetic profile and a different set of health circumstances that they come in with. And those nuances, you know, really can dictate along with the person's, you know, unique physiology of how they, how they, di how well they digest eggs, how well um, they feel after eating eggs for, again, like just to take Dr. Walls as an example, eggs aren't a bad food. And she doesn't at anywhere say in her book, eggs are a, a bad food that you should not eat. But for herself, that's a food that kind of quickly results in symptoms for her. So she knows that's her body talking to her and telling her, this isn't good fuel for me. And really that's the ultimate answer for, you know, for each of us is to figure out what works best for us when we can hear our own, you know, our own body speak to us. Perfect. Perfect. All right. For you personally, Paula, and for, for those of us who are trying to do a better job with our nutrition, um, off the top of your head, what are your three best snacks that are healthy that you could comment on? Oh, that's a good one. Um, let's see. Um, hummus comes to mind, um, top of mind for me. Um, you know, organic again is always like, you know, a, a layer of that, a preference. Um, so looking for good quality hummus and making sure that you can identify all the ingredients in there, that they're all words, you know, and recognize, and there's no funny, crazy oils or additives or numbers, God forbid, in the ingredient list. Um, avocados are another great um, food for snacking, um, I think. And um, if I had to limit it to just a, one more category, I'd say um, some some veg, some either some, you know, raw cut up veggies to go with either of those things. That would kind of be my those would be some of my go tos. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to because the listeners don't know yet, but we're going to have lots of really cool stuff on there about how to put together some of these snacks and 
things like a healthier smoothie and um, you know, quick grab and go kinds of snacks. And for that matter, you could make your own hummus and add those cut up vegetables to it and have a, a two for one. So great answer. Absolutely. All right, we have time for about two more questions before we have to wrap it up, announce our next content. And for our, our new friends here, they just, just please know that I am recording all of your questions. And one way or another, we will make sure that we cover them either in the summary or in um, in the next class, we will we'll pick them up. I'm trying to combine them quickly for the ones that seem similar. All right, yeah. Paula, how can we get in? And I know that this is, uh, we're gonna probably have to make this a shorter answer that we'll find our way back to. How can I get in good quality nutrition when I have daily nausea and food aversions? Any advice on that? Yeah, that can be tricky and certainly something to talk to, um, you know, provider that can work with you specifically on that, because what elicits a nausea response for one person doesn't necessarily elicit the same response for someone else. But, um, typically like a broth kind of, um, a clear broth if with some nicely cooked, easily, you know, digested vegetables can be a really great place to start. Um, if the broth is well made, it can contain a lot of nutrients and really sustain during a time when eating is really not something that you're excited about. And um, a broth, a light broth with with or without some some veggies can be a great nourishing um, meal to kind of get you through those times. Yeah, that's a good one too. And I, I would also comment maybe a little bit of ginger, some really nice ginger tea is really is a really great strategy. I'm making a note on this one yes. because that yeah, this is a, that's an important question. Okay, um, juicing question up my alley. I love this this one. Juicing. How often is it, in your opinion, to juice? How often is good? And um, is there a, a juice that you would, a, a juicing strategy or a kind of juice that you would recommend that is um, leaning towards a triple negative breast cancer that's, that, that's healthy for somebody with that diagnosis? Well, I can't really speak to necessarily a specific diagnosis and, you know, a specific regimen for that, but juicing has some, some different schools of thought. And one of them is when you remove the fiber and the content of the plant that you are juicing, you're kind of, yes, you're also um, kind of compounding nutrients, but you are also removing the things that our body needs from that plant, which is like the substance of it, the fiber and, and the, the kind of the meat of it. And you're, a lot of times then also compounding sugars, um, even if it's a vegetable, it has some sugar content. And so you can end up with this really high glycemic drink. And that's, that can be a concern for some people on the cancering journey. So, um, you really have to talk to a provider about what's best for you, but juicing versus smoothies, um, is something to kind of really think about and think about what, nutrients you're concentrating there, how much sugars are in there and how frequently you want to do that. Juicing can be a great way to get in and smoothies, get in some nutrients when a meal isn't, you know, appealing or something you're able to get down. So it is a way to kind of get in those good things when you're really struggling, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on juicing alone to kind of give you those things that you really need to get from your meals as well. So um, that, you know, again, sugar content has to be looked at. Got it. That's good. That's good. Good response here. One more, actually, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more, two more. Um, can bone broth protein cause headaches? And if yes, is there a natural antihistamine supplement that might help? That's a good one. Yeah. Bone broths can, um, can be high in histamine. And again, it depends on the person. Histamine can be like, um, think of it like a bucket and we all have that bucket and different things go into the histamine bucket, environmental food, uh, stress can also change the way our hormones are dealing with, uh, things in our body physiologically. So on any given day, our histamine bucket can vary. It's not a fixed 
thing. So if you have bone broth one time and have a re reaction that was, you know, not so pleasant, it doesn't mean that forever you won't be able to have bone broth. Um, it's possible that for a period of time, you're in a place where it's um, your histamine bucket is very full. And there, there are supplements that can help you break down histamine um, there. You know, it's, it's a DAO enzyme that, that is involved in that. Um, I can't remember, Stacey, did you ask me for those specifics or? No, no, she was, just, she was asking whether or not there was a natural antihistamine supplement that might help with, with are, the headaches. Yeah, I mean, quercetin and turmeric, um, and there are some herbal blends of supplements that are, that are helpful um, antihistamines and that are also have other health benefits in the body as well. So you kind of get a lot of bang for your buck there, but there definitely are um, antihistamine herbal blends that are lovely for um, kind of helping break down the histamine in the body if it's kind of overwhelming. Okay, so Joe, we will um, we'll expand on that answer because that's a that's a good one. I know many of us uh, know the value and the in the the uh, added value that bone broth can add to our our diet. So I'm like I said, I did a I went down and recorded. We still have some pending questions as it relates to supplements. We have some a question related to iodine and breast cancer. We have someone who was eating healthy for a very long time and she was the one that ended up with the diagnosis. I have recorded them all new friends and I will make sure that I discuss completely with, with Paula and we will pick it up. And I think some of the questions will um, unfold and, and we'll, you'll get the answers that you need um, in subsequent classes. So we do have to wrap it up. I, I, that went by so fast. I hope that you all um, enjoyed as much as um, we did presenting it to you. Um, like I said, I'm so grateful and thankful that we have Paula with us for the next couple of months. I'm grateful and thankful that we got our founder on here for our first class. But most importantly, I am sincerely grateful for all of you for giving, uh, putting your faith in, in our new program. One of the things that all of us on the team are very passionate about is the wait time in order to get you to the next step. If you are somebody that is seeking specific nutrition information based on your diagnosis. And this program was birthed under the umbrella of wanting to bridge and give you some foundational pieces while you are waiting to take it a step further. So um, our goal is to create this lovely library that you can refer back to, um, and we will learn from you as well what is pressing and on your heart and what you really were seeking the answers for. And if Paula can, um, if Paula can share it with us, I know I can give you a promise that um, it will be research-based and, 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 and current. Um, so I wanna say thank you. I'll say thank you from Paula. I'll say thank you from myself. I'll say thank you from Ivalice. And I'll say thank you to all of you. Um, we will pick this up in two weeks. The next topic is, if this topic was why does food matter, you can expect the next topic to be incredibly um, impactful in regard to why the quality of your food matters. So things like uh, conventional versus organic We'll be discussing uh, GMOs. We will be discussing processed versus that conventional um, food sourcing. So you don't want to miss that. Don't forget to do your homework because what I will do at the end is I'll have you highlight any places that you see that are good things in your nutrition and ones that you might want to consider making a switch for using our three-day food journal, which you will get in your follow-up email. Thank you so much, and um, we'll see you in two weeks. Sound good? Sounds great. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you.